Hello and welcome to lecture number four, from which today we will cover chapter eight and nine of our little tiny book, right? So my name is Stefan Eriksson and well, let's just get started. I'm glad um, I'm glad that uh, you guys are all here. You know that there's a term going on today for those who are part of this course, but it could be you're watching this back later and then you'll be like, ah, the midterm is over and it's perfectly fine. This is also the day from which the group assignment will be uploaded. It will be uploaded late in the afternoon, I think around four o'clock. So watching this back, it will be four o'clock the day this lecture went live, right? So four o'clock, guys. So I hope that also answers to any questions that may be in the chat regarding this. We are going to be dealing with chapter eight and nine, as I said, and this is the, well, core of the group assignment. Two things we're going to be dealing with. Chapter eight, which is about decision rules. Chapter nine, which is, well, an introduction to capital budgeting. We'll get back to more about what all this about is about later today. So let's first recap what the hell is going on in this course and why are we doing what we're doing and where are we at today? I know this may seem a little silly, but it is very good to know where we are and where we are heading and where we came from. So what does this course do? We look at optimal, emphasis on optimal, corporate financial decisions. Whether you produce a certain product, invest in a technology, keep my machinery or buy a new one. Okay. And also, how do we actually fund this? Debt, equity, sell my kidney or mark plots? I don't know. We will figure that one out as we go through the course. And of course, do I borrow the money? Do I fund it myself? Or what are the costs? What are the benefits? Is it worth it? I don't know. That's what we're going to do here today. So that's actually what we're doing in this course here. So we've been actually working a couple of weeks already because we're already in like four. So what did we do the other three lectures? Well, we looked at this simple cost benefit analysis in the sense that costs are typically immediate. You buy something up front, but all these good things to come to come they materialize later right so you cannot compare stuff that happens in the future with today you have to kind of convert it to the same period of time right so that's what we've been doing we've been with different cash flows we've been looking at what should you discount with what is your discount factor what is your discount rate so on so on that's what it actually did so we used the opportunity of capital last week in depth right we looked at all these beautiful bonds both the James versions, also the corporate versions and government versions, right? So all these nice things, right? That was not too bad, I hope. And we also noted what is indeed this opportunity. Talk a little about it, but I put it on screen here just for a help you a bit, right? But we still have a lot of other things we have to do. We have to also notice where do we get this information? I already said we looked at bond yields because that is about debt, but we also have the equity side of things from which we have not dealt with just yet. These are all the things that will come in chapter seven and 10 till 13. 13 to be sure is where we actually mix all those two together to the weighted average cost of capital. But just to be clear, we looked at bonds, debt financing, which where we look at the yield to maturity as this investor's opportunity cost of capital. Next week, we will do stocks. We we'll start with chapter 7 and 10, the after 11 and 12, and finally, chapter 13, we pull it all together, and hopefully, it will all make sense at the end. That's what we're going to be doing for the rest of the course. Now, what are we doing today? We are going to look at, well, the upper part of this little equation. We've been working a lot about this little tiny R in the bottom. Okay? Now, hmm, we let I actually look this way here now to look, make it look good, right? No, we have to look at the, those cash flows up there. We've been looking a lot about these rates. We're going to get back to them, don't worry, when we look at stocks and equity, right? But we have these cash flows. What are we going to use? That's actually chapter nine. But chapter eight is about all these decision tools we have in order to tell, go for it, or should we not go for it? That's essentially what will happen today. So I hope that that is fine. That's exactly what's going to happen. So chapter eight is not that long. It's not that difficult. So we will hopefully get over that one pretty fast and then spend most of our time in chapter nine. And here we look, of course, at these uh, cash flows, like I said, but also what do we do with depreciation? You heard about that one before, probably in a course about accounting, financial accounting. You probably heard it there before. We're going to be dealing a lot about that. That whole, it's going fantastic today, guys. 
And also we have this term free cash flow. We're going to be having a lot. But that's it. I hope that everything is clear so far what we're going to be doing today and what happened so far. Now, I'd like to go to chapter eight, which is the first of the two chapters we will cover today, of course. So, investment opportunities, they're all around us and we, they're not further away than the tip of our fingers when we have our smartphone or computer right in front of us. But now you're a company and we, the decisions are a little bigger than what are we going to have for dinner tonight or am I investing in Bitcoin or Dogecoin? going to take it a little further and look at a little more like as an investment right as a firm so how firms actually decide this well we have some rules that first of all before you can even use these rules you have to evaluate all costs and benefits that is that we have to calculate everything in terms of and values we've been doing that a lot already so you're all experts in that by now or at least you will know after the midterm today but those are the things we'll be doing today. And all these things what we need to gather together to what is known as the net as the net present value or NPV for short. Probably just say NPV a lot this uh, year anyway. But what is NPV? It's the present value of the benefits minus the present value of the costs. And the rule is actually simple. If NPV is positive, you take the investment. And if it is not positive, you don't take it. Roll credits, that was the lecture we need to do. There's nothing more I need to say today. That's the short version, right? Wish it was that easy, but of course, a lot of other things behind this. Let's dig a little deeper and learn about, oh, where does NPV come from? Are there other tools out there? Well, the answer is yes, and there's a lot to learn, and there's a lot of other tools, and why is NPV stream? So, let's get to it. Look at this nice little chart up here. We like these timelines, right? You see at time zero, you have an investment and year one, two, up until then, you have these cash flows. Notice the negative sign in front of the investment as typical, because, well, it's a cash outflow. You're paying for the investment, right? And then the cash inflows, which are your benefits that materialize, well, in the future to come, right? Oh, that was a strange sentence. Wouldn't be the first nor the last time I say such strange things in stream, right? But you see here that these have a positive time sign in front in front of them just to indicate that these are cash inflows. Money in the business, right? Not money out of the business. Okay. I hope that's clear for everyone here. Let me actually take a look. Like so um so far we're just sitting at uh, the lowest uh, attendance ever, but uh you know what? I'm happy that you guys are here. You see here, we're going to summarize all these cash flows till today, and you can simply just put it the following way as you see on screen right now. That's basically just a summarization of what we did in two plus. Yeah, that was essentially just what we did. Calculate everything as net present value. Just another word for it, right? So that's still not too bad. It's all things we've seen before, and everything can be denoted as this summation sign, which is just a sum from time zero up until capital N, that is the end of the lifespan of the project, as these cash flows divided by or quickly, which are multiplied by the discount factor. Remember, the discount factor is one divided by one plus r to the power n, where the discount rate is just the r. Don't mix those two things up. And of course, the rule is simple. If this NPV that we calculate here, here turns out to be above zero, take it. That's not so bad. And of course, what should we use as R? Well, we should use R that equals to opportunity cost of capital. But today, we're just gonna assume that it's given. We're not gonna work about how to calculate that. No, look more about first, what are the rules here? We're gonna look into these cash flows. We're gonna just assume that it's given. Let's first look at many of the other criteria because that was essentially just NPV. We read chapter eight a little in the book. That was actually it. There was not much to it, but there's a lot of other rules. So let's briefly go out of the, over the other rules. It's not that they're not important. They're just less used, but you should still know them because, well, questions may appear and they'll be nice in practice. Rule number one we're gonna look at is the payback rule. It simply just looks at how fast does the project that you wanna invest in payback itself. In other words, you wanna determine for how many time periods, capital N, as you can see up here, from which this cash flows equal zero. In other words, you want to simply just see how fast does it break even. So 
if I pay for a project, how fast does it repay itself? Because then you know, okay, after this period of time, this project will make money. That's essentially it. There's, of course, I'm just going to mention a short here, of course, but when you look at, say, I have the book here next to me, of course, when you look at all these nice things and all these nice rules, there's, of course, all these little flaws to the rules and why we would use NPV and such. I'll only mention a few of the most important ones here today. And for the rest, it is up for you to study in the book or look it up. So that's just what the payback rule is. There's not much more to say about it. There's, of course, some downsides and upsides, but you know what? We're just going to skip away to the IRR, which is the internal rate of return. This one, next to NPV, is what I also believe to be the most one. What it actually does, it sets what is this rate R, which is basically similar to the that we learned last week, from which this NPV becomes zero. So we notice here, we have the cash flows. Cash flows, which is divided by one plus the IRR. You want to find for which IRR does this break even. What rule does that come out of that, actually? There comes a rule saying, if the IR is higher than some given cost, uh, opportunity cost of capital that you have set, then you take it. Lower, you don't take it. So basically just saying whether it's uh, like NPV, it's uh, above or below zero, you now say here is above or below my opportunity cost of capital. Suppose it's little r is 10, and IR is calculated to be anything higher than 10, you will just say, take it. That's essentially what it comes down to. I'm going to go a little more in detail with the IR uh, rules here and when it is better and when it is not. So it's not, and then maybe there's some fixes to it. But that's essentially what IR is. One note uh, additional about it. It may take a little time to actually calculate. This is just trial and error, guys. So you just have to try to solve. You can, of course, use a financial calculator to solve it for you, but if you do it by hand, this is trial by error. You do a few times and you get quickly close to what the number is zero. And then, of course, you can just find it rounded to say one or two decimals. You don't have to go to a thousand decimals. That is, well, needed. There's also a profitability index from which you simply index all these different projects that you have in terms of how much money do you get out of them compared to the initial investment. You see up here, PI, which stands for probability index, is simply just the NPV divided by the initial investment. So if the NPV is Archer, then your initial investment, you get a nice here, of course. Wait, and then you can see how it actually works. This one here is especially good when you face capital constraints. That is, you don't have unlimited amount of cash to spend, so you can't just pick all the projects out there. Because suppose you have a long list of projects, they may all have positive NPV, so you should all take them. However, you may have to choose between because you don't have enough money to go for all the projects. So while all projects may be nice and their own merits, all. Therefore, you can calculate a probability index to see which the huh, if you want to use that terminology. Okay, then you have an interesting one here. That one is also, I think, the well hardest one calculation-wide to use, but let's try this one out. This one has one time where it's really nice to use. That is when you have different products draw checks, checks to choose between. However, these projects do not have the same lifespan. That is, one project may last for two years, another one is free, another one is four, but they're not equal, right? And then how do you choose between? One way of doing it is to transform this into an annuity, actually. You have the NPV of each of these projects, and you simply divide it by the annuity formula where the input is R and N. N being, well, how long is this lifespan of this given project? And R, what is this discount rate that you will use here? Opportunity cost of capital, of course. What do you get? It's actually what are the monthly repayments it would have been. Suppose this were an annuity instead. Which books page is this again? Ah, there's a, this one is very nice. So let me see what page it is in the nice little book we have here. It is starting on page 278 and 279. You see the formula for the cash flows. It actually corresponds almost one to one with what you did in chapter four when you tried to solve for C using the annuity formula. It guys, it's not too bad, right? And those are 
four main other decision rules that we have, other criteria. So you have NPV, which I would like to call Kingpin. That's simply just an important one, I think. And here's the four other ones. That doesn't mean there's not other ones in addition to those. These are just some of them, but the most important ones. They all have their pros and cons. But here is how they're, well, here's the, here was the short explanation of how they actually work. Now, I'm going to sort of go on a little bit because we've got a few more things to cover before we dive into chapter 9. First, we have some nice 20-year-old material. Now, nah, but it still holds true today, even if I update this graph. This just shows, in practice, what is actually used. So this may be written a little small, but all you need to know is look at the first two ones. Look at the first two ones. Let's, uh, let's uh, yeah, put a box around that. You see which are the most used ones. Typically, firms will use a mix of different ones, but as you can see, in three out of four, 75% roughly, firms will use IRR and NPV. So these are, as you can see here, the two most important ones. You do also see a few others that I haven't ooh, discussed here, which is the hurdle rate. There's also sensitivity analysis. We also have some multiples, real options. All these are additional things that we have not covered, but also things that could be important in practice. But as you can see, IR, NPV, the biggest player out there. Okay, so what do we learn? Let's look at these two and when should you go for which one and what's the problem with one and what's the problem with the other. And for those, there's a few comments on that. Typically, both come with the same conclusion. Typically. That is, if NPV is positive, you would also, when you calculate the IR, get something that is higher than the opportunity cost of capital. So regardless of which one you use, they will come to the agreement. They will both say take or no take. That was easy, right? Actually, this holds true if you have a direct investment and future payoffs, which is a classical timeline we've seen. That is, as time zero, you have a cash outflow. And in time one, two, three, four, five, up until end, the end of the lifespan of the project, there's cash inflows. If a project has a profile like that, it will agree. No problem. That's fine. However, if there's other versions, not agree. To specify a little what they will agree with, if it looks like this. What you see up here, that's just a classical profile we've seen before. There's investment at the beginning, down payment, say, the investment for a project. And then you have the cash inflow starting in CF1, CF2, CF until N. These are the inflows. If the profile looks like this, then they would typically just agree and it's fine. Then it actually doesn't really matter which you use. However, or say however, I should learn to be done saying all the cool stuff before I say however. So let's postpone that however a little. You can of course draw an NPV profile, which you see up here. The book has a few panels. So this is a panel for the book. And to show here, the green area shows from which the NPV profile is positive. That is when the NPV Likely to be positive. In other words, if this, um, what's the best way to say it? If the rate of cost of capital falls, in this case, below this number here, you will get a positive NPV and it will say, take it. You see the discount rate here, let me force in here. You see here that the NPV is positive if the discount rate is below 14%. So, being below 14%, you see you're in the green. However, if it's higher, you get a negative NPV. You shouldn't take it. And again, this translates directly. You calculate an IR. The IR is given 14% for this example project. If the IR would have been, say, lower than the cost of capital, so suppose it fell below 10%, wouldn't take it. In this case here, as long as the cost of capital is below 14%, which it is because it's 10% in this example, you will take the project. You also see there's perfect agreement between IR and NPV. So it doesn't matter which one you use, they will yield exactly the same result. But again, this was because we had a typical payoff um, pictures. One investment beginning and a lot of cash inflows or benefits in the future. Now, there are problems. If there are delayed investments, Suppose that it's not just one lump sum at the beginning, then there may be trouble. Then you may get into issues from which, well, 
results and they don't really agree. Now, there may be, first of all, multiple IRs, that is the case. So suppose that you have an investment decision to make. You see that there are a payment today, but also a payment in two years. But the benefits already started, like in year one. So you get an outflow in year zero and year two, and benefits come in, or cash inflows come in year one, two, three, four, five, until end. If you have a, a setup like that, you will get multiple IRRs. That is, there'll be multiple points from which there'll be an intersection with the x-axis when you draw this line. So it will shift from a line to it, right? But it will shift until, well, second degree. If there's two, also shift to a third degree, fourth degree, but then we get a little too mathy for this. But in such cases, you will prefer the NPV rule. Because this is how it would look if you would have a delayed investment, for instance. Again, this is taken from the book. But notice here, if you see IR, it produces two numbers. So actually, you would say, huh, if my opportunity cost of capital is below 5.95, we will take. If it falls in between here, take. And if we fall, go above here, we will take. Hey, that's weird. It, this just looks weird, right? So, in other words, when you're faced with such a profile like this, to really do it the right way, like this here, what do you see? You see indeed, hey guys, this here should be used NPV4. Thank you very much. That is actually just so. This seems like an excellent coffee. Nothing better than watching back a video of me drinking coffee, right? That is simply what everybody uh, comes here for to see, right? Or am I mistaken? Now, that's one problem. But of course, we can well, fix it. Yeah, Slowpoke, you're absolutely right. There is a fix to this. So let's look at this potential fix to the IIR that can overcome this problem of delayed investments. Let's look at it. What is it called? Oh. You're kidding me, right? It's just called the modified IRR or MIR. Har har. Well, let's look at an example for this because we haven't really looked at many examples today. So I feel like an example. Let's go for it. Suppose you have the following cash flows. Just for example, you will have a profile that looks like this. We have three cash flows. At year zero, there's an investment of $1,000. Yes, it's very US dollars. In year one, you have a cash inflow of $2,500. But then again, in year two, you will have a cash outflow of $1,540. So this case here would yield multiple IRRs. And if you calculate, you get 10 and 40% respectively. Thanks, Slowpoke, for remembering numbers because I don't really head. So that's why I have you. Fantastic. But okay, here you would definitely prefer NPV. But we could actually just try and fix this. Let's try and fix this a little bit. So what do we see? What do we see? We see now if we would try and modify these cash flows such that we again get an order from which there's one outflow followed by inflows. Let's try and fix this here. What we can do is, like you see on the lines, we push the cash flows around using the rules that we have learned earlier in lecture two, for instance. So what we're going to do, we're going to discount the $1,540 back to time zero and add it to the 1,000. So we're going to calculate the present value. And then we're going to, well, calculate the future value of these 2,500 up until the end. Because we don't want to change the lifetime of this uh, project because that will also mess it up. So what you're actually doing, you're putting all the costs in the beginning and all the benefits at the end. That's what you're doing in this mere technique, modified IRR. So what do we do? Calculation-wise, well, you have $1,000, as you see on screen here. We discount this by two periods, one, two, so here divided by 1.15, because that's the cost of capital we assume for this year, just assuming 15%. We could have done it with other numbers, but I'm just using 15% in this case. What do we then do with the other one? Well, we push it forward by one time period, you see here. You see here, we just multiply this by one, of course, to the power of one, I just like to write the power just to really strongly indicate this is pushed just one period when you don't have to because 
why is it 1500 instead of 1540? That's a good one. That's a typo. Typo, boys and girls. It should be 1540. Oops. Can't all be perfect. So let's try this again. We are discounting at two periods. And no, we're not just removing $40 for administrative costs. No, no, no. There's no uh, administrative costs issue. So you're just pushing it around like this. If you do it like shown above here, you will now produce one IR because we have one outflow, one inflow, and you get it 15.25%. And actually what you see is you take the project. IR is higher than the cost of capital. Huh. You know, not by much, still. Okay, so that's what we learned by this little example of near modified IRR. It still doesn't solve all problems. Yes, you are absolutely right, Slowpoke. But it does solve the problem of these, well, delayed investments. You still have a problem with scaling, different lifespans. Everything was depicted in the book, but this was just to tackle one of the issues. So yes, mere can at some points be better. It doesn't solve everything, but it definitely solves this here, which makes it, well, plus one for them, right? But that's, of course, not all. So at this point in time, we're now done with chapter number eight. And I think actually this is just a great time just to take a small break now. I know it's a little early, but it's better to take the break now and simply just, you know, start fresh for chapter nine. So I'll take a small nine minute break. Nine minutes fun. Oh, it's because it's 11.31. So I'll see you guys back in nine, 10 minutes. Later. And uh, well, until after, guys. Welcome back. So now. See that I also corrected the slides now, so everything should be fine for future use. Uh, and thank you very much. So let's carry on with chapter nine, which is the bigger chunk for today. I hope you can still hear me. I hope it's still loud and clear. Let me know. It will be very much appreciated. Otherwise, I'm just sitting here and talking one. I'll be sad. But you know what? Let's carry on with chapter nine. Okay, so what are we doing here? Oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. We're doing capital budgeting, which is, as my little sign here suggests here. Well, first of all, part of the course uh, title, so we should really deal with this, right? It is the process of analyzing projects and investment opportunities and deciding which one to accept. That is essentially how you <coughs> budget your capital. Wow. It's, uh, but okay, let's carry on here first. So what are we doing here? We need first the present value of all benefits and costs. We already dealt with this uh, before, but which are actually these benefits? Because up until now, we have just assumed that, oh, there's some numbers. There's some numbers and these are the cash flows and whatever. But how do we actually get these cash flows? Cash flows? And that's what I mean by these CF how we look into this formula and how we determine the cash flows used in these formulas that we have, right? One thing is you could use net income. You could think that's fantastic. And in terms of, uh, oh, there's a nice thing in the chat now, but I will take it at the end of the lecture if that is okay. And this relates to Catherine. Seen, I hope that is fine by you. We take it at the end of the lecture today. And one possibility is look at net income. However, we already saw in chapter two, so lecture one, that Net income is not exactly cash flow because part of this net income doesn't really move anything. In other words, there are some costs that you have when calculating net income, such as depreciation, which is actually not a cash outflow. We also see that there are some incomes on this part of the net income that are not really cash inflows. For instance, counts receivable. You count them as some uh, like net income for future, but it's money you actually haven't received yet. So. It's not an actual cash inflow. So there's a few things we have to take into account now. First of all, since depreciation is part of an investment, it's tax deductible. See, I really dislike tax, calculating with tax and all. I pay my taxes, that's not it. But point being is I really just dis dislike calculating taxes. But of course we know there's two certainty in life, death and taxes. So we have to be able to deal with one or other. And the thing is here, when you look at depreciation, the amount you depreciate with will make it different for your taxable income. So depending on whether you depreciate a lot or a little less, it would actually have an impact on your net income. And 
how much can actually be taxed. So it could be smart to think a little about how we're going to actually put this in the books. And a lot of companies, they get very creative with this, as you've seen some. But uh, we're going to show a few ways how to do it. So this is the closest I get to probably do creative bookkeeping. So listen. But OK, there's a few things here. The thing about depreciation, what does it do for you? You buy a machine, technology, you buy some inventory, you uh, building or you buy a nice office chair or whatever. Depreciation allows you to lower the book value of such asset time, like to indicate that it's been used, right? Because just because you buy a car today for, say, 10,000 euros, it's not ten, worth 10,000 euros in one year. There's depreciation. But to account for this, you actually use this in bookkeeping, right? So how can we do it? Well, suppose for this nice example, you buy a piece of machinery for 1 million euros. A hell of a machine. Suppose it's uh, the super awesome ice cream deluxe machine, for instance, right? You buy it for 1 million euros, it can make whatever ice cream you want. Fantastic. To account for the cost of using this machine, you would depreciate it over multiple years. One way of doing it is just via using a straight line. Fantastic, right? So you can do it like this. You see at time zero, there's a cash outflow, you're buying the machine. And from year one, two, three, four, and five, yes, five, then you depreciate straight lines such that after five years, the book value would reach zero. Each of these five years, you depreciate 200,000 euros straight line, assuming the same depreciation amount every. Okay, that's cool. So that's actually not too difficult to calculate. And this is how it actually would be done. This is also just more of a bookkeeping stunt, right? But okay. There are, of course, more ways to do it. There's also this MACRS, which is more of a percentage depreciation. So it weighs heavier in the beginning and then less. That one actually works very well when you think about cars. Like, let me see if there's some examples here. So it actually says that there's most use in the beginning. So we imagine you're buying a car, drive from the car salesman home. It's already depreciated like what, 20% of the value or more? Or at least said another way, it's actually just the first year or the first part of its lifespan where depreciation takes place or most of it takes place. That's actually one way you could do it. So one way to profile it's like this here. So you still have your annual outflow or you have your outflow in the beginning at time zero. But now, the five years to come, you don't have like 200,000 a year. No, you depreciate much in the beginning. So you take first half of it off the first year. Boom. Then this, its book value is now 500,000. Then the second year, you take another 200,000 off. So now 300,000. That was some quick math. And now we take another half of it off again. So there's 150 left. Then the fourth year, you take 100 off. So there's 50 left. Then the fifth year, you take the last 50. That's how this would be done. Okay, these should hopefully not be the very tricky parts of the course, but it's good to know regardless. I also, if I don't remember wrong, if I remember correctly in this case, there's also a nice appendix to chapter nine and learn more about this MCRS depreciation technique. But mathematically speaking, this is not where the big brain says, okay, you can do this. But yeah, what is free cash flows? Oh, Slowpoke, you know it. The Slowpoke may know something this time. Ah. Okay, yeah. What is free cash flow? That is the incremental effect of a project on a firm's available cash. So we have just learned that earnings are not actual cash flows because of, say, depreciation or accounts receivable. So what do we need to determine the NPV? We need the free cash flow. And well, thanks to Slowpoke, which is absolutely correct this time, what is the free cash flow? That is the incremental effect of a project on a firm's available cash. So you just want to look at the a value added. That's it. So that's one way to do it. So we need to look at the free cash flow. For that, in order to do that, we have to go back and dig into our financial state. I know that is not the most fun thing ever to do, but it's part of the deal. So let's look back at our financial statements. That is the balance sheet, an income statement, in order to, well, find the components. So let's look at a nice little income statement here. Next to me, we see up here, we learned in the first lecture, it's already so long ago, 
what we learned here when we looked at an accounting purpose here then you can see here that you have all these cash flows so wait it's a cash flow i'm doing very well today so you see there's different kinds of cash flow you have cash flows from patients we have cash flows from investments and we have cash flow by well financial activity so it's called the financial however there's a few things about this we need to calculate free cash flow which is done similarly to what you see here similar way very similar but there's a few things we have to be aware of and this is where the differences really comes in so how does the difference come in here well look at it here we have in accounting terms all of it as operational cash flow for instance you have the change in the working capital and you have interest expenses however for a financial point of view this changes to investment cash flow and financing cash flow. and there's a few things here we want to do importantly we want to evaluate the project thinking about on its own merit we have to separate it from the financial decision so here we're not taking the financing decision into account at all that's a different matter here we just want to evaluate how this project in question affects our cash flow separately that will be the only thing we would do First. fantastic ah so we have to ignore financing cash flows this is also stated in the book very important very very important you can read more about this on page 301 that was page 301 in the version 4 of the book so you have to not include interest expenses dividend payments and these kind of financing things we call this all equity fiction or better word it's a good word let's just use this equity fiction so we do not include this that is simply just separate all these financing decision stuff like that that comes in the second part of the book which is for not for here so for that only focus on cash flows from operations and investments so with that in mind let's go in and check how you would actually calculate the free cash flow but first absolutely right math alert sarcastic math alert because this shouldn't be too bad but i have to say it. thanks slowpoke for a lot for alerting us about this math coming in first number one we determine the operating cash flow the way we do it we call it just cf underscore here put it like this what you have here is the earning before interest and taxes okay then you tax it one minus the tax uh, tax rate so tc is for tax the proper tax rate that you have and then we add back depreciation why did we add back depreciation again because depreciation was not a cash flow we already established that so that should be hopefully clear why we add it back indeed you don't take the interest expenses here because you see earning before interest and tax not so bad that's number one math wise this should be easy peasy we're going to get uh, so there's a question in the chat now and we talk about but how about increase or decrease in for instance accounts receivable we will get to that just in a moment so don't worry about that i hope that will be answered here if i do not answer this perfectly in the minutes ping me again okay then we know it here number two we look at the invest cash flow that's number two what we do here we call it cash flow from the investment so this is the capex so the capital expenditure and here's another little term here we use delta operator to denote the difference in the net working capital Next slide we'll talk more about but for instance this is the investment in this fixed asset that we are talking about and this here is the investment in net working capital in other words how much money do you need to tie up in the business business to run it and this calculates simply just the difference operator here is just difference between time t and time t minus one using a little more plain language it just means difference between right now and the previous time period previous time period could be a day a week a month a year typically this is done in yearly basement so base basis so this would be the network and capital day minus the network and capital last year so you get the difference between the two donut we denote that by delta op nice little brief okay how we do it we put them together so you get the free cash flow is earning before interest and tax 
and to note about this account receivable and what these kind of things are. They are in here. It's just like we add back depreciation. This is already in here. So that's maybe a short answer to the question in the chat from earlier. But you see here, we tax it, one minus the tax rate, add back the depreciation because cash flow. We subtract the investing cash flow, which is the capital expenditure, minus the net working capital. So putting all this together, that is how you would calculate the free cash flow. But there's more about it. There's more about it. So first of all, note, we ignore the financing cash flow. Number two, why do we use the change in networking capital? Let's step back a little bit. Ask ourselves, what is it actually? Well, we can see in the book, of course, what is determined it's both in chapter two and nine. So let's just use one of the things here. Networking capital is calculated as current assets minus current liability. We can do a little better than that. So let's split it up a little bit. Notice here what actually appears. Ta-da, what is networking capital? It is cash plus inventory plus accounts receivable minus accounts payable because these are the amount of cash that is tied up in the company to run it, right? So this also relates directly to the question asked in the chat. Hopefully you see now, hopefully you see now what accounts receivable and accounts payable have to do with all. This. Please let me know if this answers your question. Meanwhile, I will carry on. I got another question in the chat, but that one I will reserve for the end because this regards the midterm. So I'll reserve that for the end of the lecture. Okay, so what is account receivable? If you don't know, there's a money that I still have to receive. So typically when a customer buys a product from you, you'll give them say normally what, two weeks? Sometimes more, sometimes less to pay up their bills. In the meantime, this is accounts receivable. So it's goods already sold, but money is still to come in. Payables on the other hand, well, you probably guess what it is, but it's money that you still owe to someone. It is the difference between debitors, debitors, and creditors. So this is typically from your suppliers, but you still owe some money. That's the difference. Money in, money out. Okay. So like I already said a few times here, but now we have it also black on right here. What does it mean? It means more cash needs to run the company. You need to add more cash in just to make the firm running. That is what this net working capital actually means. So when you calculate this free cash flow, you have to take the different account. Important. So, okay. <sighs> that actually stays for a very good point there, but there's a lot more to come. This was just solving. I hopefully keep it nice and intuitive here because we don't want to make it too affy. So let's go back to this free cash flow here. Oh, look at the statement you have on the screen here. Slowpoke, you're absolutely right. This looks very much like assignment stuff, which all the students will notice this afternoon. So I hope they're paying attention how to calculate the free cash flow because it's not as if they're ever going to do that in assignment, do you think? Oh, okay. So what a look at it here. We got some years. We got year zero, one, two, three, four of a given firm overviewing some project. See here, we have some sales. We subtract cost of goods sold. And notice here the way we do it, we don't add a minus sign note, we use parentheses to indicate that this is a cash outflow, other words, instead of a negative sign. You then get the gross profit. Then of course you have all your administrative costs and research and development, are and all these kind of expenses here, and then you have the depreciation. Cool. Then you get the earning before interest and tax from which you tax it. And now when you tax it, you had to add back the depreciation as we learned before. Oh, and maybe you should have also run it. Looking here. Cash flows and corporations, right? So you see here, get this here. That's the unlevered net income. You add back the depreciation. And then of course we subtract any capital expenditures in the year there was. There was no in year one, there was in year zero. But of course, we have to change the networking capital, which kicks in here. Once the project is done, well, the cash is released again, and then it comes back in as a positive cash. Right? So this is how this would work in a cash flow statement. Look at here. This is the cash flow investment, this is the cash flow operations. Add those two together, and you get your free cash flow, as you see in the here. So just take a deep breath and do this column by column. Row by row, cell by cell, and this should be just fine. This is very important, of course, for the for assignment. So 
Let's carry on a little bit here. How do we translate hash flows into NPV in order to actually make some transition? This is kind of where it actually ties back to chapter eight that we had before. You had all your free cash flows. Nice. Then of course we discount them all, calculate the present value of these cash flows using in this case here 12%. So you see here, these are the discount factors. This of course is the one divided by one plus R, R in this case 12%. So that should not be bad. So then we add them all up. And then of course you get an NPV where you say, okay, what are the benefits minus the costs? Notice here the, benefit, the NPV is actually positive. So from an investment point of view, using the NPV rule, we take it. That's how this would work. Okay, and I already set the cash, the factor here. And of course we sum them all up using, well, some operators indicate this is just a sum of all columns. So this is actually, as you can see, already tying together all the things we discussed so far in the course. Not too bad, right? So you see here, we use the discount factor, 12%. We use the sum of the present values, calculated present value, we use the sum, which here is the NPV. We use the regular the rule saying, well, is NPV positive? Answer is yes, therefore we take it. Also all of that, that's not so bad. Now, let's look at some practical examples. Yes, we, we could also ask ourselves, why, why are we even doing this? What, what is so interesting about this? Well, let's look in practice. Here, we have something from Shell. And this is just to see how big firms like Shell have their cash flow over time. So we see here, this is the red here, is the free cash flow. So actually, some years is actually negative. That simply just means they actually, for that period of time, they don't have enough cash to actually meet their needs, which is a... Uh, typically a red flag, but sometimes it can also just be an accounting measure or an accounting practice that makes this to be negative. You will see that in a moment, for instance, when we look at Netflix. But okay, these are just uh, definitions. I mean, know this is very short, very, very small and very hard to read, but this is just the definition of a free cash flow. They also put it here, but you already had the definition already, so you already know what it is, thanks to Slowpoke. So, okay. And of course, yeah, thanks, you zoomed it up here. But that's not it. I got more examples for you. Look at this one here. This is just to show that big firms just like Apple has so much cash. It is unbelievable. This is more than $50 billion. So their cash flow is absolutely joke. So this is the free cash flow. That's the money they just have available to spend. Available to earn. Not all companies, they have positive cash flow. Look at this one here. This is Netflix. Notice what happened. They run a nice little positive cash flow business, uh, the occasional negative cash flows here and there. No, okay. And then starting from 15, it took a severe dip. But this has many reasons besides accounting measures. But this was also a time where Netflix invested heavily in new shows and everything. Well, it turns out to be a very good decision because, well, they, they could not invest much in shows later on because we have uh, everybody here. But that goes on. I don't know what this anybody can lie me what this was, but so it turned out to be a quite good decision. If we flip it to the other side here, we can also see what their net income at is actually over this time period. No surprise, this net income actually exploded in 2020, and it actually further seen to increase at the end of 2020, beginning to one where we are sitting right now. Reasons should be pretty obvious why Netflix are making okay. I got more examples. We got Tesla as well, because Tesla's awesome. Let's look at it here. Tesla burns cash. That's no secret. This was back from 2017, where you can also see how big their negative cash flow actually became. So I have a few, uh, few uh, pictures here indicating, well, why production help. A lot of problems with their new models at that time to be produced. But actually, we can just see here how the cash flow evolved over time. You see first, for years and years and years, Tesla produced more and more negative cash flows. The news article that I showed you just right before indicates around here June, from which it was 1.2 billion. And actually it got even worse right after where in September you went down to, well, around say 1.4 billions in the, right? So you see here. Then of course, they actually managed to flip this around starting starting late 2018, which is, well, very cool because now they're actually in a moment from which their cash flow actually turned out to be positive for quite a bit. 
They do, of course, have the occasional very big red here, but this is a much better picture than what they had when you look back at 2015. Back in that time, you were thinking, hmm, Tesla never really turned a profit yet, have they? But well, you still have a hype around. Look at the stock price. It's insane. It's the more Tesla than that. There's a lot of considerations we have to do with cash flow. So this was just some of the things. But of course, calculating these things, it's not just what I showed you here. There are a lot of caveats and a lot of things you have to take into consideration. Be very, very careful with. Let's start. First, we are only interested in the incremental cash flow. The additional cash flow comes from this project. That means we have to include the following. You have to include externalities like cannibalization. I'm showing that in just that. But suppose you're a firm, you have a new project that you undertake. Calculation of these free cash flows, you have to also say, does this new project damage an existing product? I mean, that's cannibalization, basically. We're going to see that in a moment. You also have to introduce opportunity cost. And oh, thanks a lot, but because I don't re oh, it's not always I remember this by the word. But what is the opportunity cost? Well, it's the value a resource could have provided in its best alternative case. We also learned this microeconomics, but now here we get the statement again. What is opportunity cost? You have to include that when we talk about free cash flows. But you have to, on the other hand, ignore sunk costs, which are just irrecoverable costs at this moment. Time. So the firm already incurred the costs. So no matter what you decide, that cost is gone. So that shouldn't be taken into the consideration. That can sometimes be very hard for people to understand. Just know when a cost, for instance, uh, marketing research has been conducted, and then you want to make a decision about this here, don't think about the cost for this marketing research because that cost is a sunk cost. It already took place. No matter what you decide, that cost happened. And you have to be very much aware of allocated overhead. And I want to make a note about that. So I put up in the book where I want to find that. In the book, it is on page 309. And here we are talking about activities which are not directly associated only to this project at hand, but things that reaches for more projects around the firm. So this could be um, what what goes under this here, for example. Uh, anybody wants for example was an allocated overhead? What I can come to my head is, for instance, the CFO's pay. You only need to include the additional pay he would have if undertaking this project. What could otherwise be allocated overhead? Uh, or these overhead costs? Rent of the headquarters, for instance, that should be an overhead cost, right? Only if you are, for some reason, this new project would increase this, then you would uh, then you would have to include it. But otherwise, things that are already allocated, so fixed. Nope. Indeed. Yeah, very good one from the chat. Cleaning an office building. Yeah, that shouldn't really change. Unless that undertake this project for some reason makes it more dirty and makes the clean cost go up. But in general, you're absolutely correct. So very good example. Thank you very much. Actually, this would be a fun time to see how many people are there. Oh, 42. Answer to everything, guys. Thanks for showing up. So let's go a little more about cannibalization. I have a nice example graph here, which is iPods, iPhones. So first, when Apple introduced iPods, great. Uh, I had one. You had one. But it was nice. But when the iPhone came in, and no, I never. But when the iPhone came in, there was a cannibalization cost here. Because, well, why? Because the iPhone could do what the iPod could, but more. Simple, right? So actually, there's a few more things about this here. And also, yeah, yeah, I have more information on the iPod, but let's first talk about this slowpoke. I know you're a little in. But you can see here, there's a cannibalization effect here by introducing the iPhone. So when they made this calculation themselves, Apple, you had to include this down cost or, well, this expense that you would lose sales on the iPod. Let's look more about this information on iPods, shall we? This is also just to show that in 2014, they stopped reporting sales for it because at that point in time, they were seizing, it was seized out or it was becoming obsolete because the iPhone simply just took over. It's basically just iPhone, iPad, iPhone, iSmack. That's pretty much how it went on, right? So you see here, this is how all the models, 
else did I have? Mm. At a shuffle. I actually had two shuffles. That's what I remember now. At the shuffles, they're really nice when you went running. So, okay, cool. But of course, nowadays, it's actually really, you can't really, there's no iPods. Oh, one second. Correct me if I'm wrong. But these are the things you have to do here. Okay, okay. So that was not about this. There's still more considerations out there. We have to include tax effects. So that means we have to use the after tax benefits and costs. Because remember, when we calculated free cash flow, we taxed it. One minus TC. TC being tax. Indeed, rip iPod. Okay. That means when we talk about tax effects, there's also something called the depreciation tax. So again, the most tax I'll ever talk about in this course, I think. I may want to revise the statement later, but let for now just say that's most of it. So we have something called capital gains tax. That's about all these things we're going to show on next slide. So let's dive into this depreciation tax shield. What is it? Before we get there, we have to ignore the finance and cash flow. I've said that a lot of times already, but what is it? Yeah, Slowpoke. Good point. Maybe it's important in assignments somehow. I don't know. Maybe we will leave that up to the students to figure out. Well, yeah. Let's carry on here. Okay. Talk more about this tax shield. So, even though depreciation is not a, it's not a cash. We already established that multiple times. There is a positive effect on the cash flow. And this little positive effect is called the depreciation tax shield. Sounds cool when they call it a tax shield. It just reminds me of Captain America shield. Not really that. But let's just look at what it actually is. You can count for it either implicitly, when we're going to show it first, but you can also do it explicitly. Let's look at it implicitly first. This was the calculation for the free cash flow. We had some slides back. You had operating cash flow and the investment cash flow. You add them together and you get the free cash flow. Okay, that's one thing. So you see here, we deduct depreciation to calculate it. Cool, we deduct the tax and we add it back. We had that before, that was what happened. One extra thing. This little tiny bit here is what we call the unlevered cash flow. You've seen in the slides a little earlier, but this also just to where you actually see it. We're not going to deal with it too much in this course here, but it may come back and haunt you in the next course. So this is just a notice. This is just a note. This is the unlevered cash flow. Okie dokie. We can also account for it explicitly, and we do it the following way by simply just rewriting this equation. Notice I'm saying rewriting. It simply just means that no matter which one you use, you should get the same. If you don't, there's something. So the way you rewrite it, revenues minus cost, you tax it, you add cap X, and here you see here you took out the depreciation and taxed it over here. Because now you notice here, this little term here, DN, now, also in here, you see this is now tax shield. No, not Pokemon shield, unfortunately. Let me see here. This does not include depreciation. You see, you actually took it out and moved it in the back and taxed it here to explicitly count for the depreciation tax shield. This little part here is what has a positive effect on cash flow for the firm. It should both give the same result. I guess this is just a rewriting of the equation, so mathematically they're identical. You don't get the same, try again. Still don't get the same. Made made a mistake, so try again. Just for good measures, try again. So, okay, there's something called a salvage value. What's that? A salvage value? What is that? So far, we assume that when you depreciate something, it hits zero eventually, right? We had that example for five years depreciation, and after five years, it was zero. Regardless whether we use the straight line or the M A R C S, it was called. Oh, maybe wrong here, but okay. However, in reality, when you get rid of a machinery or an asset, right? Maybe some money to get it. Maybe able to sell it, right? Be sold or after this lifespan it's actually not fully depreciated there may be reasons for which you want to, uh, don't want to do that so still the book value is still above zero both cases which can have let's look at it this liquidation or when you say you 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 liquidate an asset that is you're selling it right this is part of the investing cash 
So that means that at the end of the lifespan you're putting up here, you buy a machinery, you expect you're going to have it for 10 years. After 10 years, you sell it again. This projected sales is part of your investing cash flow. So there's something you have to take into account as well. Cool. So there's actually a different tax rate for this because this is what is called a capital gain tax. Let's look at how this actually works because this may already be a little. So I have a lot of math on the slides here, so maybe I should have math alert. Let me see. Okay, I'll forgive you. Now, first, what is the after-tax cash flow, cash flow from an asset sales? Well, that's the sales price from whatever price you sold it for, minus this tax rate. So I call it tau C. That's the capital gains tax. Multiply by whatever capital gain you have. What is this capital gains tax? Well, first of all, let's look at what's the capital gain. That's the sales price minus the book value. So in other words, if you have the machine for a while, your book value was zero, so you depreciated fully, but you sold it for something above zero, say so you sold it for 10,000 euros, then you have a capital gain of 10,000 euros. There's a tax to that, say 10%, probably unrealistically low, but just for example, 10%. Then you take 10% off, so you're left with 9,000 euros. Then you have after tax, which is the sales price minus this here. That gives whoop, 1,000. Oh, I did math. Fantastic. Hopefully I did it right. But okay, what is the book value? We already had that, but let's just be explicit. It's the purchase price minus the accumulated depreciation. So that means for in our little example here from earlier, and also at it again, it's the price to which we bought the machine initially, say the 1 million euros, minus all the appreciated accumulated over time. So if you do this one year, 200,000 or half a million, depending on which you use. And then after all the time, you may have a book value of zero, because if you depreciate onto zero, well, the book value should be zero, because it should be purchase price, but it may be still positive. Then, of course, if the sales price is equal to the book value, there's no capital gain. There's no gain on it. That means that, well, tax it. It's SIP. However, what if it's above? So like you see up here, what if the sales price above the book value get a capital gain? That will unfortunately have to be taxed. The tax that he comes in. Like we said earlier, there's two certainties in life, death and taxes. In this case here, what if the, I actually thought so a little bit, what if the sales price actually goes below the book value? Basically a bust, right? Then I need to look it up, but I'm 99% certain. This is just me guessing a little bit here because we don't usually use in the course, but here there'll be some, you can subtract it. Like the tax steps. What, what do you call it? I'm calling it something wrong here. Tax break, right? It's like when you also have negative profits that you're not turning profit, you can actually deduct this in tax. It's kind of the same idea here. And very well, also from the from a student in the chat. It's basically getting money from the government, sorta. Well, it's something you can uh, subtract in tax. It's tax <clears throat> tax deduct. Let's carry on. Let's uh, round this up and talk about investment decision tools because that's one little subtopic extra in chapter nine hidden in here because these are also very important for the assignment. Oh no but also just important for whatever you're going to do afterwards. Sam, but also after the course. All. Let's look at it here. So, your decision that you make, regardless of what decision you make, will depend on some assumptions. And these assumptions, oh, what is my cost of capital? That's a big assumption. Then 12%, 15%, 42%. Only God knows. How much do I have to spend? How much will revenue grow? See, all of these are just a list of assumptions. And a thing you would learn also in other courses, say you have statistics or econometrics later, the model that you use is only as good as its assumption. That's a very important thing. Now, what would be the future price of my product? These things can be hard to forecast, but all these are just assumptions, which actually means if you pull all this together, the whole NPV thing is at best just a guesstimate because it's based on all these assumptions. Which is why we come to these extra tools now. Take a moment here. But it means we need to come with some kind of analysis where we can see how my decision depends on changing these assumptions just a little bit. Hmm. 
So let's go on. First of all, we can look at the profile. We've seen this before. We can see how changing the cost of capital on which area we will see we still get a positive NPV. It means we can likely to happen. Happen case for which or we can have a worst case for which is higher. We can simply try this in what we call a sensitivity analysis. Okay. Go for sensitivity analysis. So how does your NPV change if you change one assumption? Like the cost of capital, like I just had. How much does that actually affect? So let's look at the example here. You're going to see a few more examples in the assignment uh, template we're going to upload for you guys. You will see that, for instance, you have your weighted average cost of capital here, and you can see how your NPV is changed along with changing the capital expenditures thing here. You can see how your NPV changes when you're changing one or two of these assumptions. See, that's interesting to also show your future boss or investors, hey, this is what would happen if our assumptions are a little off. Not just give them one value, but also show, hey, the needs to change either a little or a lot before this investment comes up or investment. But just because you do this doesn't mean you're always in the clear. Basically said another way, shit happens sometimes. You can of course also do scenario analysis. What is scenario analysis compared to a sensitivity analysis? Here, you're just simultaneously changing multiple assumptions, not just one, but a lot at the same time. So for instance, we can see here, we have three cases, the most likely, best case and worst case. We can see here, we change all these assumptions, both from capital expenditure, revenue growth, vacancy, cost of capital, and so forth. And the list just goes on. And then we can see how the NPV and IRR changes as we change multiple of these assumptions. So basically, you're doing the calculation multiple times for different levels of all these components. That's simply it. But of course, you can look at the best case and the worst case and put up a nice little graph like you've seen here. Now, take a minute just to look at it. You see here, when you show these nice graphs to your future boss, or an assignment like I show here, you should show here, okay, what is likely outcome? What's the most likely value? It's typically to put C up here. And you can see, okay, what is my NPV? That's the case. NPV lands is a sample of 5 million. Take it. However, you also have a best case for this certain unit sold. This is about projected sales. Then you can see if our unit sales turn out to be a 130 instead, well, our NPV becomes much larger. Then you can also see here if the sales price turns out to be lower, it has a negative effect on them. But very important, you also have the worst case here. Absolute worst case. Unit sold is a complete flop. Like a Wii U was a flop, for instance. <laughs> actually, I want to see what a Nintendo actually made again because it was a complete flop. Then fortunately, they had to switch, which were uh, is awesome but you can see here you have the line here which is the break even value that is the point from which these individual components would have to drop in order for the npv to go negative so you see here let's take an example sales price you have to put the sales price ridiculously ridiculously low for this to actually go below you see you have a lot of wiggle room you can also see what the cost of capital which is probably one of the most important one here you can see that you can actually live with, in this example, with a very high cost of capital before you get a negative NPV. But then again, units sold, very important. You can see that one is this example here is really the one that really changes a lot of things. Now, we have a nice example here of Shell in the Arctic. This is really nice because you actually see back in the day. So Shell, they went to Alaska all the way up to Barrow, I think called the northernmost polar town up there to drill get some oil right but after a disappointing drilling season they decided to cease all activity now what happened they did all their analysis like you see here this is an example of all the analysis they even did like nice mpv analysis they did a sensitivity analysis they showed hey in uh, in our normal base case here we're looking good we're looking good what is our uh, projective uh, values here we see here, oh, see forty dollars a ton. Okay, great. We see here that the oil price here, wow, we will fetch somewhere between seventy and one hundred and ten. Based on this here, you will see, well, that's the profile we come up with. So they showed their investors, hey, we actually did our calculations. 
this turns out to be pretty solid. Anybody remember what happened? See the time here? This is April 10th, 2014. Don't know if any of you were into all this financing back then, but what happened? Well, oil price. What happened to the oil price? It plummeted. It went all the way from around almost $100 a barrel, and then oil price just dumped completely. Yeah, there was a lot of other things where they had to go out and say, I'm sorry. But the fact is, the oil price plummeted way more than what they assumed in the analysis. Remember, the analysis was 70 to 110. See it here. That oil price went way below. Way, way below. Indeed, on a side note here, this was a great South Park episode indeed. So you see here, that was bad, right? So that's exactly what happens here. And they were not the only ones. But okay, with that said, this is time for a recap. This is also the moment where we're just going to go over everything we discussed today because there was actually quite a lot. So let's summarize this in a couple of slides. Just to go over it briefly again. First, we looked at investment decisions. We had all these different rules. The most common one is the NPV rule. It's also the one you should just use per default, I believe. It doesn't mean the other ones are not good, but it just means this one typically is the most correct one and the most, well, let's say foolproof. It's just overall the best one. Okay. And of course, it just comes down to choose projects if, if positive. That's easy. Anybody can figure it out. There's, of course, other ones, which is the IR being the biggest one. But of course, we also had the payback one. We had the profitability index. We had the MIR, remember, the modified IR I showed an example for. We also had the equal annuity thing going on. All these different ones, they exist, and they have their own merits. But of course, that was only a small part of today's lecture. We also discussed the free cash flow, which was the bigger chunk here, because spoiler alert, or not so spoiler alert, this is in the assignment, and it will also be on the exam, I can guarantee. So we learned quickly, earnings are not the same as cash flows. You have depreciation, you have accounts payable receivables, which are actually not cash flows, so they need to be, well, adjusted. Let's call it like that. And of course, we need to adjust that. And the way we do it, well, we have to talk about cash flow from operation, investment cash flow, and we have to ignore financing cash flows. That's very important. So the way we calculate it is as follows. You see up here. This is, again, a slightly rewritten version because I just wrote uh, earnings before interest and tax. But here I just wrote it out. And you see here, this is the unlevered net income, this part here. You have the earnings for interest and tax, tax it, you add back depreciation, and then subtract your capital expenditure and the changes in net working capital. You can, of course, also account for the depreciation tax shield explicitly by using this formula instead. It should give exactly the same result. This version here show exactly how much the depreciation tax shield boosts your cash flow. Okay, that's one thing. Okay, there's more, of course. We have to look at the incremental cash flow. So it's very important you only look at the project's own merit and what that has an impact on your cash flows, not what it does with all other things. Right? So you have to simply look at only those things. So there's, of course, all these other things we looked at, what you have to take into account and not into account, allocate over some cost, externalities, all these kind of things. Very important to, uh, to note all these things when you're calculating free cash flow. Finally, we looked at NPV as a guesstimate. At best, it's just a guesstimate. In other words, it depends on a lot of assumptions for which we should make a sensitivity analysis. That is, we should try to alter one of these or more of these assumptions to see how it affect our NPV. So we can try to adjust the cost of capital up and down and see how that affects NPV, the earnings, the size of the capital expense, and so on. Show your investor or your boss that you want to convince, convince that this is a solid investment option. And with that said, that should actually cover all for today. I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. It was quite an intense one, I think. There was a lot to cover. So I hope you enjoyed it. And with that said, have a good day. And until next time. Mm -hmm.